So last um, Tuesday, Wizards had a big reveal stream regarding the upcoming Commander Legends. Actually, I'm not... Do this. Hey. Um, so Commander Legends is coming out next month. And it's the big commander product for the calendar year 2022. And we're returning back to the Forgotten Realms, Universes Beyond, which is their licensing agreement um, and actually internal property of Dungeons and Dragons. Baldur's Gate being a very popular place, town, plane in Dungeons and Dragons. So it's pretty cool that we get to go back uh, to Baldur's Gate in particular. I think I liked a lot of the Baldur's Gate cards from the original D&D set last summer. So it's cool that we get a commander product. It's very wordy, the title. Magic the Gathering, Commander Legends, Dungeons and Dragons, Battle for Baldur's Gate. It's too many words. Um, so this is a little brief intro by Harless. And then they kind of dove into the, the product itself, revealed a bunch of cards. We're not going to do like a pre set review, um, today. Here's some, just some alt art from all of the revealed cards so far. We are going to wait a little bit because the final previews are happening on the, like the 26th. So I'd rather do, a uh, a pre-release set review um, once we have all of the cards versus just uh, about half of them what we're currently at right now um, so they revealed the pre-release packs which come with uh, three draft boosters uh, the commander legends draft boosters are a lot larger so don't be scared that there's only three draft boosters in this pack they they aren't your normal draft booster um you also get a traditional foil rare or mythic card from boulder's gate with a year stamp on it so it'll be your your box topper foil you get the reusable box an arena code and a d20 Pretty standard stuff for the pre-release sets. The box art looks pretty hype. They are really focusing on this dragon and a lot of the key art, which is cool. And it looks like they're they're sticking with this new box design, which I have a few of up here. The the new packaging and everything. I'm just I'm very much loving it. It all functions really well. It's feels like it's a lot less waste. I think there was, you know, at one point they had the bundles that were a lot taller. I don't have one up here, but there, there was a lot of wasted space and I, it didn't really seem like there was a purpose for it, a reason why. So they've shrunk them down, made them fit just the like necessary products and pieces. We got draft boosters. Um, these are the packs that are going to be in your pre-release pack. Um, this is what the product looks like. Um, like I said, the, the draft packs for Commander Legends products are always a lot bigger. That's why you get three instead of five for a sealed event. Uh, each pack contains 20 cards, one legendary, Creature or Planeswalker, Rare Mythic uh, in 31% of boosters. One Legendary Background, Rare in 1 in 12 boosters. 
One non-legendary rare mythic card, three uncommons, 13 commons. One traditional foil of any rarity, one token, add, or dungeon card. This is kind of like the layout that they like to provide. Uh, while you're drafting Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate, you'll take two cards at a time and build a commander deck containing a minimum of 60 cards. So we're playing Singleton. It's a commander game. Um, it's a commander product, so we're playing commander. Um, draft commander works a little bit differently. Like I said, you build a deck containing 60 cards. That includes land. Um, you get three packs of 20 singleton. Or actually, I don't know if it has to be singleton. Uh, you can add faceless one. So faceless one is a colorless commander that you can default to if you need to. If you haven't picked up any commanders that fit your playstyle or that you want to try or that match kind of the rest of your deck, the other cards that you've drafted. Um... Okay, because you're drafting this deck, you don't have to obey the singleton rule. So basically, you're just making a 60-card deck with your three 20-card packs. And again, that doesn't include land. If you purchase a display box, you may be eligible for a special buy box promo, which is this elder brain that they revealed a few weeks ago. Uh, set boosters are pretty much the same thing as normal set boosters versus um, versus draft boosters you get uh, one foil etch legendary or background one legendary creature or planeswalker one legendary background so you get an extra you get three legendary cards uh, one rare mythic this can be legendary or not one traditional foil including booster fun cards, so cards from the list. Uh, one common and uncommon card with rule book treatment, one basic land or foil basic, three commons, three com or three commons, three uncommons, two wild cards of any rarity, one art card, foil stamped art card, one token add helper or a card from the list. So again, they're doing that thing where there's cards that are only going to be available in in set boosters if you're opening packs. I believe that these cards will be available in like pre-cons. Um, and here's again the visual breakdown of, of what each pack contains for the set boosters. Collector's boosters. Uh, this art is really, really cool. It's kind of like synth wavy anime style um the collector boosters work just like the previous collector boosters you get one foil etched rare mythic legendary creature or background one traditional foil booster fun or extended art rare or mythic rare one non-foil rule book or borderless rare one non-foil extended art rare or mythic rare from commander Baldur's Gate one non-foil extended art rare mythic from commander Baldur's Gate a traditional foil rare or mythic a foil edge common or uncommon a legendary creature or background a traditional foil common or uncommon legendary creature or background one traditional foil rule book uncommon or uncommon, one traditional foil basic land, two traditional uncommons, three traditional commons, one traditional double-sided token. And again, everything is foiled out if it can be. And then we get into the commander decks that they revealed. So they're, they're releasing four, and they've stuck to two color combinations. Um, and, and it's interesting. There's the, 
there's only one deck with white, one deck with green, two with black, two with blue, two with red. So white and green got the shaft this time, which might prove to not matter because these cards look pretty powerful. We'll go into the four um, commanders that they've revealed in these pre-cons in a second. Just wanted to talk about uh, everything else they revealed as far as products go. Uh, one booster fun. Uh, okay. Each commander... Baldur's Gate deck contains a collector booster sample. This is a weird thing because they've like advertised that there's a, a collector booster sample. But it's literally just a pack of two cards. And they're like foil or not foil. One booster fun, rare or mythic that you can also find in Battle for Baldur's Gate. One traditional foil rule book or common or uncommon. It just seems like such a weird thing to add to these pre-cons. Maybe they're hoping that you get something really spicy and can like immediately with this purchase swap out one or two cards from your uh, pre-constructed deck with the two cards that you get in your collector booster sample. Or maybe it's just them trying to get you hooked on opening shinies. Which I don't blame them for. That shit is fun. Uh, next up, they've got the bundle, which has a really awesome, like, cartoon drawing of Minsk and Boo on it. Absolutely love it. I hope that the insert poster is reminiscent of that. We've got, so inside the box, you're going to get one foil art wand of wonder, which is the promo card. One oversized dungeon card featuring the new Undercity d dungeon. 20 foil basic lands, 20 non-foil basic lands, and one oversized red and pink die, which they haven't showed us yet. So before we jump into breaking down these four commander pre-cons, I wanted to go over the new mechanics that they've added because there's some really interesting stuff, especially if you play D&D. I think they've added two really intriguing things that kind of existed in Magic before, but with these new flavor updates and design changes, they really strike that D&D crossover mix really well. Uh, the first one is backgrounds. So when you're when you create a character in Dungeons and Dragons, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of supplementary. One of the things that um, doesn't really matter to your character is stuff like your ultimate goals or why you've got become an adventurer or you know your negative and positive character traits. Those kind of things that I like to use to kind of base all of my character decisions on. When I come up against an A, B decision, I look at my uh, choices for character alignment, background, and all that stuff to figure out kind of what would this person do most likely in the scenario. One of the things that's sort of in between your base stats and gear and the ancillary information that you give or background that you give your character is an actual background. And they're called backgrounds. Um, I can show you real quick. Uh, so if you go to like create a character on Beyond, Uh, oh, maybe I don't have any character slots left. Let's look at my characters. So this is the character I'm currently running right now. Uh, if I go to manage 
Manage character and levels. So at some point during your character creation process, you go um, from choosing a race to class to abilities to description. Um, at some point you have to choose a background and backgrounds are story driven ways to set your character up just slightly different than any other character might be playing this role. Um, you know, there's only X amount of races and X amount of classes. So adding those extra differentiators that add really tiny things to your actual character's abilities is a really interesting way to make these characters feel different from one another. If I had a party of rogues, you know, based on our background checks, we might not have characters that are all that similar. Um, so you pick a background from a long list of available backgrounds to, depending on which dungeon manual, which player's guide you're going through. And it kind of gives you a brief description story base wise to set up your character. You, you kind of make these um, character details and personality checks based on, you know, where does this person come from? How did they get here? Um, and your, the background of choice is one of those major determining factors. It even goes so far as to like give you bonuses depending on which background you choose. So my rogue here has charlatan as a background, kind of a way with people who likes to see what makes them tick and manipulate people sort of thing. Um, and he, because they got, chose this background, I got two bonuses to pr proficiencies. So I got to choose two new skills to be become proficient at. I also got um, tool proficiencies and some background dependent skills like false identity. Um, and then you go into suggested character characteristics. Uh, but that's kind of what a background does. It's the base, the cement base for all of your character defining decisions made during character creation, what your background choices and your class and your race are all the three major like factors that go into determining what your character can do or should do. And they've decided to take that idea and put it into Magic the Gathering with this new set. I know this is a little plugged, plugged. I feel plugged. Pardon me. So, in bringing this, how do you make a card that's like a character's background? And what they've done is decided that they were going to design these enchantments, which you can attach to creature cards or play on your board blank um, as, as needed. And I think that's a really smart and intriguing way to kind of bring interchangeable backgrounds into Magic the Gathering. So these two examples that they have here are Noble Heritage and Cultist of the Absolute. Oh, that doesn't make it any bigger. I don't know why that exists. Make it bigger. So Noble Heritage is one in a white for a legendary enchantment background. And commander creatures you own have, when this creature enters the battlefield and at the beginning of your upkeep, each player may put two 1-1 one -one counters on a creature they control. For each po opponent who does, you gain protection from that player until your next turn. So it's kind of a group hug mechanic where everyone can put counters on their creatures at the beginning of your upkeep. And if they choose to do that, then they can attack you. So you gain, sure their army is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you're gonna have to eventually deal with that. But 
for that next turn, they can't do anything to you, which is really intriguing. Uh, the next one is Cultist of the Absolute, which is one black for a legendary enchantment background. And commander creatures you own get plus three, plus three, and have flying death touch and ward three life. At the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice a creature. So going into that black sacrifice kind of model, it's a cheap black enchantment. You get a bunch of payoffs, but you get the downside of having to destroy a creature every time you start your upkeep. And I think these are cool. You'll notice that they all say commander creatures you have. And that's because we're going to um, look at why they've specified commanders. Um, the background enchantment that's in your commander's color identity can, of course, be played in a commander deck just like any other card. Some legendary creatures, however, have an ability that allows them to start the game with a background in the command zone. So what they've done is they've taken legendary creatures that can be your commander and basically given them partner with a background. So you can't you can't have a partner be another legendary creature uh, for these commanders, but you can have them start with a background. So you choose a hero, you choose a background, that's your commander deck. That's your partner commander deck. So Volo here is one of the uh, commanders that was revealed over the last week. Um, it's interesting to note that like both Volo and Minsk lost a color in the last year. Last summer, Volo was Simic and Minsk was white green red white green red maybe and now Minsk is just gruel and Volo is just mono blue so Min or sorry Volo the itinerant scholar is two and a blue for a legendary creature human wizard is two three power and toughness it, he reads, when Volo enters the battlefield, create Volo's Journal, a legendary colorless artifact token with hexproof, and whenever you cast a creature spell, note one of its creature types that hasn't been noted for this artifact. Then you can pay two to tap Volo, draw a card for each creature type noted for target permanent you control named Volo's Journal. So basically, the more different creatures you play, the more cards you draw. Which is pretty great. I think that's, um, if you have cards like Triska Decophile, um, cards that win you the game, depending on how many cards you have in hand, I think this is a really intriguing way to get there, because you can play, um, 13 different creatures over the course of a few rounds and then you pay two tap volo draw that many cards and then as soon as you have 13 cards in your hand you win the game um and at the very bottom here it says choose a background the one thing they've added they've basically just changed the flavor of partner to say choose a background so any commander any legendary creature that has choose a background on it you can then partner it with any legendary enchantment backgrounds super cool super flavorful absolutely love it the second um yeah yeah just want to make sure i'm not missing anything crucial i wasn't able to watch the um stream live but i've been reading up on it Checking Twitter and everything. Oh, interesting. Okay, so 
Even though backgrounds aren't creatures, they add to your commander deck's color profile, just like they do with creatures. So if you took Volo and chose this cultist background, then your commander deck is Demir, and you can have black and blue cards in your deck. Also, if someone were to kill or destroy your uh, background, you may put it back into the command zone. Um, just like you would if you had a commander creature out. And command tax, the additional cost of two mana every time you've cast it from the command zone applies separately to your background. So it works exactly like partners. They're just not creatures. And they've changed the word of it to back choose a background. I think that's probably like one of the smartest, uh, maybe not the smartest mechanic or flavor that they've injected into magic in a while, but definitely as far as, you know, reaching out of the Magic the Gathering lore and picking out something from Dungeons and Dragons to make it more flavorful. I think that is by far the smartest thing they've ever done. I think it's there's so much flavor there. There's so much nod to, you know, creating these characters in Dungeons and Dragons. Even the nod to Volo's Guide to Monsters on the on his artwork here. This is like the next step after that cover art to this card art. I think the dungeons were really cool in the first Dungeons and Dragons set, but this is by far the best like flavor win smart decision they've ever made. So the second new mechanic is initiative, which if you don't know or haven't played much magic or sorry, Dungeons and Dragons, um, Initiative is basically turn order. So when combat starts or an encounter starts, everyone has to roll initiative. And depending on what you roll, that's the order in which the dungeon master will go through the different characters involved, both player characters and NPCs. So there's this nice little button here. Um, your initiative roll is usually your... Um, base stat of zero or base modifier of zero plus your dexterity modifier so how quickly you react to things which makes sense so whenever it's time to roll initiative you roll oh i got a nat 20 live on stream nat 20. um so yeah my initiative would be 23 in that scenario and pretty much you'd have to have the flash be in our fight for them to beat me on that initiative roll. I think initiative as it pertains to Magic the Gathering is a very interesting um, kind of flavor beat to bring into the card game. I don't know that I f feel like they nailed it. I feel like it's sort of missing something, but let's, let's talk about it and and we'll see what you have to think. Um, so it's important. Initiative is important to battle for Baldur's Gate as well. In magic terms, initiative is designed, is the designation that a player can have during the game. And it's basically Monarch, sort of. It's sort of Monarch, it's Monarch light. When the game start, no player has initiative. And there are three ways for a player to take initiative. The most direct way is cards like White Plume Adventurer, which is right here. White Plume Adventurer reads, it's too white for a 3-3 orc cleric. It reads, when White Plume Adventurer enters the battlefield, you take the initiative. At the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, untap a creature you control. If you've completed a dungeon, untap all creatures you control. So it's just that top part we're paying attention to right now. The When it ETBs, you get initiative. The second way to get initiative is to attack a player who currently has the initiative, much like Monarch. 
If a creature you control deals combat damage to it, you get the initiative. The third way is um, if a player who currently has the initiative leaves the game, the player whose turn it is takes the initiative. If the player who has the initiative leaves the game on their own turn, or the active player left the game at some the same time, the next player in the turn order takes it. So the initiative reads, whenever one or more creatures a player controls deals combat damage to you, that player takes the initiative. Whenever you take the initiative, and at the beginning of your upkeep, venture into the Undercity. So this is where it kind of strays away from uh, what you would expect from the Monarch. So jumping back to last summer when we got Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, they designed these dungeon cards that basically every time you got a trigger that said venture into the dungeon, you got to progress through these dungeons um, and trigger these room abilities every time you walk, you went into them. For some reason, in Commander of Baldur's Gate, they've only added one new dungeon and that, that new dungeon pretty much only interacts with the initiative. There's no new dungeons for all of the other dungeon cards. I don't believe you can take, you can, ch I don't believe you can choose the Undercity or cards like Hama Pashar or any of the other Enter the Dungeon cards. So the initiative again reads, whenever you take the initiative and at the beginning of your upkeep, venture into the dungeon. So you have to start your turn with the initiative in order to get that second trigger, basically. The Undercity is the new dungeon here. Um, let me see if it says, players can enter the Undercity using only the keyword action, venture into the Undercity special version of venture into the dungeon so any of those previous cards that say venture into the dungeon yada yada won't work here you can't get to the undercity no matter how hard you try so the undercity this new dungeon that has to do with the initiative it's going to be a lot of um i guess bonuses like if you look at think about monarch monarch was you know draw an extra card at your end step and that's just a like a single player focused buff you get a free card draw it's not game ending everyone kind of fights over it because they want to draw that extra card but it's really not that big so i'm expecting that the undercity feels a lot like those kind of small incremental almost insignificant bonuses so the first room is Secret Entrance. Search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle. Not bad, you get a free land. Hopefully you, you get into the Secret Entrance early in the game. So I'm assuming that there's quite a few cards that start the initiative. I know when they first introduced Monarch, there was a lot of cards in that Commander Legends set that um, kicked off the monarch cycle so i'm hoping that they do something similar with the initiative uh so the first room is secret entrance get a basic land put it into your hand then shuffle again hoping to hit this first room early in the game so you can ramp a little bit faster the second tier you get to choose between the forge and the lost well the forge reads Put two 1-1 one, one counters on target creature. That's pretty powerful. The Lost Well reads Scry 2. So you got kind of green stompy version of this dungeon and then blue Scry version. And I think this is a really interesting place to put these two because, you know, say we kick off the initiative cycle really early in the game, turn one, turn two, um, by the time you get to turn three, you might not have creatures that you want to put, um, counters on. So you, you'd rather scry or maybe you have a creature that you're going to use for something else that you don't need counters on. So you choose to scry or 
You have already scried, so you choose to put counters on your creature. I think this is a great time, this second tier, to make one of those kind of decisions. The third tier is three rooms, trap, exclamation point, arena, or stash. So the you have to go to the forge in order to go to trap, and trap reads, target player loses five life. That's pretty big. Uh, arena you can go to from both of the previous rooms, and it says goad target creature, which means that when you go to target creature, it can't attack you, and it has to attack next, on that player's next turn. Um, but it just can't attack you, which is, is cool. By the time you get to the tier 3 of the Undercity, you have to assume that one of your opponents um, have something that's worthy of being goaded. Uh, the stash you can only get to from the Lost Well, and it says create a treasure token so you get free mana. The th fourth tier is archives and catacombs uh, archives you can only get to from trap or arena and it says draw a card Meh, not too bad that's just the monarch ability but um the the nice thing about this is is that it's at the beginning of your turn it's during your upkeep so drawing that extra card gives you that extra card for your turn you're about to take which is Maybe a little bit more powerful than the Monarch situation. Unless you're playing blue and have a bunch of flash or instant cards. The other room is Catacombs. Which you can only get to from the stash or the arena. And it says create a 4-1 black skeleton creature token with menace. And then the last room, which is the only... The last tier only has one room. And it's called the Throne of the Dead Tree. Reveal the top 10 cards of your library. Put a creature card from among them onto the battlefield with three 1-1 one -one counters on it. It gains hexproof until your next turn, then shuffle. And you can do this. Dungeons are cyclable. Like, they don't leave the game or leave your options. Um... Once you've completed it, you can keep doing the Undercity. If the, if the initiative keeps getting passed around, if the game goes long, you can keep pumping through these, um, which is pretty pretty crazy. That last one is, is really interesting. I think there's, there's a lot there for all types of Magic players. Even if I'm playing a Mono Blue or Demir deck where I'm... You know, I have 12 creatures in the whole deck. It's, you know, looking at the top 10 cards of your library, there's a, there's a decent chance you're going to hit a creature. I think this feels real bad if you make your way, way all the way through this dungeon, get here, and then don't hit a creature. Um, yeah, because you can't put these counters on anything else. It has to be the creature you pulled from your deck. So you can whiff on this last, this big culminating room, you can whiff on it. I don't know, it would have been nice to see like two different variants of this last room. Um, maybe, maybe you do the creature version where you look at the top 10 cards of your library, you put a creature, it gets counters, blah, blah, blah. But then maybe there's like a return target instant or sorcery from your graveyard. Um, you may play it this turn without paying its mana cost or maybe return a t an instant or sorcery from any graveyard and you may pay mana using any color to cast it. I think something something creature related, something spell related would have been a nice balance. It would have been a, a good choice to make kind of at the end of this dungeon because chances are the way that Monarch moves around so fast, often, not always, but often, um, chances are it's going to take you a while to get through this whole dungeon. So by the time you get to the end there, it'd be nice to not 
miss completely. Um, yeah, so they didn't, they didn't share anything else on the dragons. They did share that gates are coming back. Um, gates are an older legendary land type and this set being called Baldur's Gate, it just makes sense. Um, Baldur's, the titular Baldur's Gate itself is a legendary land gate add tap to add colorless mana or you can pay two and tap it to add x mana of any one color where x is the number of other gates you control yeah they're basically shrines gates shrines this one's fun because it's the boulders gate at boulders gate Um, some returning mechanics like Myriad, um, Myriad lets a creature attack in, in all possible directions. When a creature you control with Myriad attacks, for each opponent other than defending player, you may create a token that's a copy of that creature to attack that opponent or planeswalker the opponent controls. With Myriad, you can attack everyone at once, or if you're feeling particularly political, just some of them because you may create the creature tokens. So you can't create three, or you can't attack one player, create two tokens to attack the other two players, and then point all three of those creatures at the original target. You have to, those tokens have to attack the other two players, but you don't have to create the tokens. You can attack one if you have made an alliance with player two you don't create a token to attack them but if you hate player three uh you can create a token to attack them so you can attack two players at once you can attack one you can attack three myriad's pretty powerful um Ba, ba. Yeah, at the end of to at combat, the tokens are exiled. They don't go to the graveyard, so no abilities that trigger when a creature dies. It's also important to note that the tokens enter the battlefield tapped and attacking, which means that they were never declared as attackers. So any abilities that trigger whenever a creature attacks won't trigger. It's just for damage. Just spread out that deeps. Uh, Adventure is coming back, sort of. It's not expansive, I don't think, in this, but huge, another huge flavor mechanic that um, Wizards of the Coast put into uh, the previous storybook game set. Um, that w a lot of people were kind of surprised that this wasn't in the original Dungeons and Dragons that last summer but they've changed their tune they're bringing it back for the commander legends adventures are basically instants or sorceries that are attached to creatures technically in the rules when you play a card when you play the adventure portion of a card that card sits in exile and then you can cast the creature or artifact or permanent version from exile so it stays in your hand ish but it should be on the battlefield there's little adventure block tokens that you put your card on when it's on an adventure um so stuff like sea hag here has is a four one three five creature hag for five mana but it also has aquatic ingress for two and a blue instant up to two creatures each get plus one plus oh until end of turn and can't be blocked this turn so you cast this to give two things a slight pump and unblockable and then on your next turn or three turns from now you can cast sea hag for its four and a blue cost which brings the creature out 
really interesting mechanic. It plays a lot like um, Fortel-ish, but you get that bonus. Instead of the casting cost be cheaper, you get the bonus sorcery or instant. Uh, Monster Manual here is, a, is an interesting one. It's also interesting that it's in green because they took green out of Volo's colors and he is responsible for a lot of the monster manual so the monster manual ha is three in a green for an artifact that says one in a green tap you may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield this is a powerful artifact if you play green auto green gruel um, cabaretti or whatever it's called i think that that is an insanely powerful card you can fill Um, you can really fill your deck with huge cost creatures and play them for two mana. It does have zoology study for two and a green. It's a sorcery. Mill five cards, then return a creature card milled this way to your hand. So you put that expensive creature into your hand to get ready to cast it for cheaper once you play that, that card. And that's pretty much it. That's what they've shown. There's a lot of cards that have been revealed so far. Again, I'd rather wait until all of the cards are revealed. We're looking at somewhere around the 26th. Uh, it's going to be... I think it's going to be a really great set. I think there's... A lot of interesting new flavor wins. I think there's a lot of... Um really strong D&D &D nods, like they're making a Tasha card, which I'm ecstatic about because Tasha's hideous laughter is like one of the greatest magic spells of all time. Um, and we get to kind of dive in and explore and celebrate these creatures, which I am all for. There's Tasha right there. We've got Minsk and Boo and Elminster even. Lots of really great lore to pull from. Lots of really interesting known characters, unknown characters. Small nods. We get to dive deeper into them and, and have fun. At the end of the day, it's just another amazing excuse to get together and play play magic and, and build these, these cool decks. Um... And so they did reveal the four pre-cons that you get or that you can get. The black and white one is party time. So there's going to be a lot more party mechanics. Um, the headlining act of the party time deck is Nalia Denarse. She's a l uh, one white, a black for a three, three human rogue. You may look at the top card of your library at any time. You may cast Cleric, Rogue, Warrior, and Wizard spells from the top of your library. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you have a full party, put a 1-1 counter on each creature you control, and those creatures gain Death Touch until end of turn. So it's a very Azorius top deck build, and it's super interesting. I'm going to skip over the Demir one because that's my favorite, so I want to talk about it last. Um, our Is It deck is Burkrag, Cunning Instigator. Three blue red for a 3 3 dragon with flying haste. Whenever one or more dragons you control attack an opponent, go to target creature that player controls. So, in the Dungeons and Dragons set, they're going hard with the dragons and building out. Lots of Dragon Matters mechanics. So I'm excited to see what individual cards are in this one. Because there's a lot of really, really big, cool dragons in Magic History. Um, the rest of Fur Crag says, Whenever a creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents, if that creature had to attack this combat, Put a 1-1 one, one counter on Furcrag, Cunning Instigator, and draw a card. 
So they want... They want you to be goaded or have been goaded. Whenever a creature... They... They want, they want to reward you for goading others. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to an opponent, if that creature had to attack, so if it was goaded, you get to put a 1-1 counter on Furcrag and draw a card. Pretty cool. I think there's a lot of board interaction with that, which is not always the case with dragon decks. Uh, the Gruul deck is Faldorn Dreadwolf Herald. It's called Exit from Exile. Faldorn is one green red for a 3 3 human druid. Whenever you cast a spell from exile or a land enters the battlefield under your control from exile, create a 2 2 wolf token. And then you can pay one to tap it. Discard a card, exile the top card from your library, you may play it this turn. So you get to rummage, but the rummage card goes into exile, and then whenever you play a spell from exile, or a land enters the exile, you get to create a wolf token. So basically it's create as many fucking wolves as you can, have an army of wolves. Pretty fun. I think that's nice and aggro. It also gives Gruul an interesting like combat trick. Or mechanic in order to create those wolves and I think that there's so many cool ways to exile cards especially since Strixhaven that I think that deck is gonna be really fun and of course the one I'm the most excited about the one I'm going to probably immediately destroy and pull this card out and put it in um, my horror deck is Captain Nagrath Nagathrod. Nagathrod. And it's Demir Mind Flayers. The captain reads three, a blue, and a black for a 3 6 horror pirate. Horrors you control have menace. Whenever a horror you control deals combat damage to a player, that player mills that many cards. At the beginning of your end step, Choose target artifact or creature card an opponent or in an opponent's graveyard that was put there from the library this turn. Put it onto the battlefield under your control. Pretty awesome. Pretty spicy. I think with all of the new mechanics, uh, the new commander products, all of the fun that we had last summer playing, I know that the competitive wise the set wasn't received very well it didn't perform very well i think that for a universes beyond i know it's not technically a universes beyond but that extended lore product i think boulder's gate commander legends is going to be really fun i can't wait to play it i really want to draft it i'm happy that they're doing a pre-release for it because I am excited to... I've never done a sealed or drafted commander product before, so I'm stoked. I think this year is going to be a whole year of me getting to experience along with all of you that the types of products and, and interactions with, with magic products that I haven't gotten to do yet. I'm stoked. Um... Yeah, I'm going to throw this up on YouTube, so definitely head over there to find uh, previous videos. Last week we talked about uh, the new, my mind is going blank, the, the Dominaria news, the little bit of... Um, Warhammer news that we got and then they teased a tiny bit of Boulder's Gate but they knew that this big event was coming so they didn't really tease it too much I think very exciting that this is so soon this is coming out next month and yeah let me see let me double check June 3rd is re-release day 